This gospel text is a sequence from last Sunday. <clears throat> you will remember last Sunday, the Sermon on the Plain, chapter 6 in the book of Luke, the equivalent of the Sermon on the Mount in the Gospel of Matthew. And Matthew, as you remember, is a Jewish gospel, and therefore Matthew has Jesus going up on the mountain. He wants his followers to remember Moses on the mountain at Mount Sinai, receiving the law, and Jesus, the new Moses, goes up on the mountain and he gives a new law. And when he does go up to teach and to preach, he sits down because the rabbi always is seated when he is teaching. Luke, on the other hand, is much shorter. Matthew has 107 verses, Luke has a mere 30. It's a much shorter uh, sermon on the plain. It's not on the mountain, it's on the plain, because Luke is a Gentile gospel. And Jesus does not sit in the gospel of Luke. He stands on the plain and he preaches this gospel text, which we have a small portion of it today for our reading. It's a follow-up to last Sunday. So we wonder what this means to us. Now, I wrote lots of journals on this, and the question is, what does it mean to me, and what does it mean to you, where we are today? In your life, listen to this word. What does this mean to you in your life, wherever you are? Are you old? Are you young? Are you angry, disappointed in life? Is your life empty or boring? Do you feel guilty? What is it in your life that's the dominant awareness which you have? Do you feel selfish or lonely? Is life boring for you? Is this just another day or is it a gift of a new day? Where are you in your life and what does this mean to you? Are you divided from somebody? Are you carrying resentment or anger? Then what does this mean to you? And what does it mean to me likewise in my own life? I reflected a lot on that. The ideal is to allow the living word of God to invade the space of my life wherever I find myself at this moment that the Word of God is alive to me now, in this moment. Not, we, are, we have so many distractions in life. We have so many projects going on, so many things going on. Rarely do we look deeper into ourselves and discover some a deeper awareness of who we are and where we stand in life. And that's the only place in which the Word of God can come alive not in the activity and the frantic pace of life, but some deep place of silence. In Lent, I'm giving a parish mission and in another parish, and they asked me if I would give the parish mission on prayer. It crossed my mind that before we begin to talk about prayer, we have to wonder to whom we pray, who is our God? And who is, who is it, the God to whom we pray? When we gather here to worship, what kind of God are we worshiping? Do we know this God? Are we led by teachings or experiences of the past, or do we have an awareness of God in the present moment, an existential experience of this God. When we read this gospel, the first thing that we have to notice is that Jesus is speaking about the new law, and the law reveals the giver of the law. And therefore, when Jesus says, love your enemies, this reveals the giver of the law. It means that the giver of the law holds no grudges. 
doesn't ask for repayment. The giver of the law blesses those who are not deserving. The giver of the law is generous to those who are selfish. The giver of the law is infinite love. And therefore, when we read the text of the law, before we wonder how it's meant to challenge us, we have to understand that it is the revelation of the true God. This is the God who blesses those who are undeserving, forgives those who have not merited forgiveness. It's an extraordinary revelation of who God is. And the only manner in which we can begin to incorporate or incarnate this word into our lives is that we must first experience the true God. It's only when we have experienced the immense, lavish love of God for us in our best and our worst of times that we begin to wonder perhaps we can extend the same gracious blessing to others. Until we have experienced the infinite love of God ourselves, we have not empowered ourselves in grace to share the same love given to us. It's so impractical when you think about it, loving your enemies forgiving those who offend you, turning the other cheek. I mean, how are we supposed to live this way? It's, it's totally impractical. Unless in the power of the Holy Spirit, and unless we have experienced this ourselves. Um, in the Old Testament, we had the lex talionis, which is the law of equivalency, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, which was meant to be an instrument to control the reaction of a person. Okay, so if you killed one of my tribe, I couldn't kill 10 of yours. I was only allowed to kill one of yours. Make the punishment fit the crime, says Gilbert de Sullivan, remember that. So, what does it mean when we don't want to make the punishment fit the crime, when we're not living lex talionis? What does it mean? Only in the power of the Spirit can we begin to uh, understand this and put it into action. See, in the law of the world, we tend to downgrade ourselves to the level of the one we don't like. I mean, if you're selfish, I will be selfish. Um, if you are unforgiving, then I'll be unforgiving too. Um, I'm going to give you what you deserve. Not what you need, what you deserve. Um, if you make a judgment about me, I will make a judgment about you. That's, that's the way of the world. So how do we lift ourselves up and say, I'm going to bless those who didn't deserve. I'm going to forgive those who haven't earned forgiveness. I'm going to share with others the blessings that God has given to me in great abundance. It means it's an impractical way, it's an unworldly way to live. So we have a choice whether we're going to allow the human experience in relationships to downgrade us to the lowest level or we're going to listen to the Word of God to upgrade us to something more mystical and something more powerful and something more fulfilling in life. Do we belong to the world or belong to the power of God's revelation? Who is it that doesn't deserve forgiveness in your life? but you will forgive the person. Who is the ungrateful person who is selfish in your life that you will bless with generosity? Who is it made a judgment about you that you will refrain from making a judgment about them? Where is that resentment that I need to dismiss from my life? 
That's, that's, that's to live in the power of the word. I remember when I was first ordained, I was stationed down at Second and Main. And uh, of course we have many, many people at the time would come looking for handouts. And everybody had it. The mother is sick in San Bernardino. I've got a job in Long Beach. I need $5 for train fare, bus fare, and we, every kind of a story. Exactly the stories I would make up if I was living on Skid Row. And probably for most of us, we'd make up any kind of a story because we had a need. And in the beginning, I would say, some fellow would say to me, well, I used to serve mass for Father Murphy in Brooklyn great man and he said if I ever need anything go to the church that's why I'm here and I said that's very good I'll tell you why don't you wait here for a few moments let me go inside and I'll call Father Murphy and and if he says he knows you and he said that then I'll give you anything you want if he doesn't then I won't give you anything and of course I wouldn't call Father Murphy I'd come out and he'd be gone so I was going to give it to gift to you if you deserved it if you were truthful, you were honest, then of course I would help you. And after a while, I began to wonder, perhaps, perhaps I shouldn't give you according to what you deserve. I probably should give you what you need. If you need a couple of dollars for a beer, that's a human need and it's a good need. And it's okay, fine. So how do we, how do we stop judging people and respond to what people need? The selfish person needs a blessing of kindness. Those who make judgments and condemn need a blessing of understanding. How do I inconvenience myself according to the word of God to bless the undeserving? In the last two weeks, we had eight funerals here. We've got two more this week coming up. I don't know why, but we've got a lot of funerals these days. And uh, it caused me to write journals on death. And um, so I was writing my journals in the last couple of weeks on my own death and reflecting on what this means to me and how to make it proximate to me in prayer. For a long time in my life, in my last incarnation, I had this notion of a severe judge and do I have enough in the bank and am I okay and am I sure <laughs> that infinite love is sufficient to cover me? Yeah. Um, but then the more I read the word of God and understand who God is in my life, I say if my true God is infinite love, understanding, patience, blessing, those who don't deserve like me, uh, holding no grudges, turning the other cheek. If this is my true God, how could I fear? What fear do I have? I have no fear now. I have discovered the wonder of God. I have no fear of dying. I say, praise God. To die is to be born into the wonder of God's infinite love. It's a marvelous awareness. It's an awareness without fear, without anxiety, that comes only in a place where we experience the power of infinite love. In 1975, I found this extraordinary holy man, became my spiritual director for 26 years. And every three weeks, I went to confession to this man, holy Jesuit fellow. He died there some years ago. I hope my confessions didn't hasten his death, but I knew it probably didn't help, didn't help for a long life. But no matter what I said to this man, it doesn't matter what I said, he would affirm me in my goodness. He would say, no matter how awful and terrible, he'd say, I know, but you're good. And I said, don't tell me I'm good. I'm not good, I'm a sinner. And he said, no, but you're good. And after a while, it was his sheer kindness that challenged me. It was never his judgment. He never made a judgment. It was the sheer kindness, the patience, the goodness, 
And I took this to be a small human reflection of the wonder of God speaking to me. So where do we go with this? Who is it in your life that doesn't deserve but needs forgiveness? What inconvenience in your life have you withheld? The person doesn't deserve it. Um, where is it that you need to go and ask for forgiveness? I do, you do. To be humble and to say, I have sinned, I have, I have been selfish, I need to ask for forgiveness. Where is this? I've often wondered, we make novenas looking for things and we pray fervently, we ask people to pray when we want something. I wonder, how often do we go on our knees to thank God for what we have? To be aware of the blessings we have. To do a novena of gratitude. Eucharist comes from a Greek word meaning gratitude. Do we come here to pray on Sunday to thank God for the many blessings which we have and to ask God to enliven us, to soften our hearts, to make us generous, to allow this word of God to come alive within us. Henry Nouwen in one of his books says, here's your choice. You can live life under a curse or under a blessing. You live life under a curse, you'll be whining, moaning, uh, life isn't okay, uh, nothing is perfect, uh, you know. This is kind of a miserable way to live, you know. If you live life under a blessing, you'll say, God is with me. The power of Jesus Christ is with me. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. My life is good. I can walk in peace. My life is fulfilled because I have read the Word of God and the Word of God reassures me that I am a chosen person, I am a blessed person, and I am sent into the world to share the gifts that God has given to me, undeserving that I am, the gift to be shared with those who are undeserving. Tell me, in our social order, who's undeserving? Who doesn't fit? Who are on the margins? In our churches, in our society, the undeserving are. And what does this gospel say to us about those on the margins. It's worth thinking about. It's an interesting personal inquisition. Worth a second thought. Amen.